I want to talk today about Immanuel Kant's ethical theory. Kant and his ethics remain immensely influential today. In fact, if you look at contemporary ethicists, I would say most of them fall into one of four categories. They are either intuitionists or consequentialists or Aristotelian virtue ethicists or Kantians. So Kant's view remains a prominent player on the contemporary philosophical scene. Why is that true? I think he's getting at something immensely deep about the nature of ethics. I'm not sure he is as comprehensive as he thinks he is. Nevertheless, what Kant is saying about human dignity, about human rights, about respect, about a variety of subjects in ethics seems to me fundamental and to have had a huge influence. It continues to be represented among all ethical theories in a certain sense. Kant's influence is felt even outside of that group of people who consider themselves Kantians. So what is Kant's ethical theory like? Let's take a look at the very first sentence of the groundwork of the metaphysics of morals. Nothing can possibly be conceived in the world or even out of it, which can be called good without qualification, except a good will. There's a huge amount we can say about that one sentence. Nothing can possibly be conceived in the world or even out of it. Let's talk just about that for a moment. What does he mean can be conceived in this world or even out of it? Well, out of it, what is he referring to? Here I've got an image of Captain Kirk and Spock, partly to make the point that, well, Kant is saying, look, a lot of early ethicists have thought ethics is all about identifying the good for mankind, about identifying the human good, about treating the ultimate good as happiness. Maybe, as some of the consequentialists do, as pleasure in the absence of pain, maybe in an Aristotelian mold as something broader, flourishing, thriving, living well. But whatever we say about that, it is something for human beings. Kant says, well, look, I'm interested in something that is deeper than that. I want a basic ethical truth that doesn't just apply to human beings, that moreover doesn't depend on matters of fact in the way that that depends on facts about human nature and what we care about and what we want. He says, instead, I want to say, look, we should be able to judge things on an alien planet. If I go to another planet and see another species, these beings are not humans, and I see certain arrangements there, I want to be able to say, that's unjust. Or if they come and start trying to conquer us, I want to say, look, they're doing something morally wrong. And what would enable me to do that? If my theory is built around the good for humanity and, then, and something about human nature, then I don't know what that's like, but I want to say there's certain things that are fundamental ethical truths that apply to human beings, but would also apply to Vulcans, would also apply to Ferengi and Klingons and any other alien being, in fact, any rational being at all. And I want to say that applies not only within the bounds of this world, given these matters of fact, but they would apply in any world. If I think, well, what if such and such? My ethical truths better apply there too. And so I've got to think not just about this world, but about any possible world. I've got to think about not just human beings, but any possible rational beings. So he is after bigger game than Aristotle is and than some other people are. He is looking for these basic moral truths that hold in this world and in other worlds. In other words, he wants them to be necessary. He wants them to be a priori, independent of experience of this world. So you might think that, look, <laughs> when we talk about things being good, we might just mean good for something, right? Oh, that's a good fork or a good tool or something. It's good for something. Yeah, that's a broad sense of good. But then we can have in mind more what Aristotle does and a variety of other thinkers do, like the consequentialists. These things are good for mankind. They're good in general for us. But Kant says, I want to know what's good for any rational agent at all in this world or in any other possible world. I want necessary truths about the good for any rational agent. And that's a much more restricted set. Presumably, few of those things that are good in general for something or that are even good for us as human beings are good for any rational being at all. He says, I want to see if there's anything like that. And if so, find out what it is, because it's going to be at the very heart of ethics. Let's go back to that first sentence and notice something else about it. 
Nothing can possibly be conceived in the world or even out of it, which can be called good without qualification, except a good will. Good without qualification. What does that mean? Well, a qualified good, I think Kant means, is good for something. It's good under certain conditions. It's good if certain things are true. An unqualified good, or a good without qualification, would be good unconditionally, good no matter what. Not merely good if you want to go to law school, or good if you're looking to get a little extra cash on the side, or good if you want to open that door that's been stuck together by rust. Not that kind of good. Those are qualified goods. And lots of things. Most goods in the world are like that. But Kant says, I want to know what's good without qualification. Not just good if this, or good under certain conditions, or good for that particular purpose. I mean good period. Good no matter what. What is good without qualification? Now, what's the connection between these ideas, by the way? He is interested in what is going to be good in any possible world for any rational being. And so this is good under any set of conditions. He's asking for something that is going to be not just true here, true for me, true for us, but true, period, across the board, in any possible world for any rational being, in this world or even out of it. And so, he says, look, I, I want to know what's good under all those possible circumstances. Don't tell me what's good here or what's good for this purpose. Tell me what's good, period. What is good necessarily? What is intrinsically good, you might say it with Aristotle, but as we'll see, this is not the same concept as Aristotle's idea of an intrinsic good, something good for its own sake. Only a few of those things might turn out to be good without qualification. Good without qualification means good no matter what. Well, we can distinguish then two classes of goods. And notice they are separate. We had an overlap between intrinsic goods and instrumental goods in Aristotle. Here, it's either with qualification or without qualification, so there is no overlap here. That's already a clue. This is not Aristotle's concept. This is something different. Well, let's think about some qualified goods. I am wearing a white shirt here. It's a good shirt. I've had it for a long time. It's lasted well. It's a really nice cotton. It feels great. It's good on a hot day. When I walked here, it was 96 degrees. By now, it's 104. It's it's very comfortable. It's a good shirt. Well, is it good under all conditions? It's good under a lot of conditions. I recommend it highly. But on the other hand, is it good under all conditions? Well, not really. I might be out there laboring in the sun, and I might think, you know, I'd be more comfortable if I took my shirt off. Or maybe somebody says, listen, I, I want to practice target shooting. Do you mind if I shoot at you? <laughs> This is not going to be good for stopping a bullet. There are going to be other conditions under which this will not be good. If you say, um, uh, yeah, I'm going to put you into this tank and put you in a condition of being you know, below zero, well, I, I want something warmer than this shirt. It's not going to be very good at very low temperatures, and so on. So we could say, yeah, this shirt is good in a wide range of conditions I care about, but is it great for facing freezing winds and conditions? Uh, is it good for all sorts of... Well, no, it's not good for those kinds of things. And so it's good under certain conditions. My glasses are very good given my eyesight. They're very good for me, so they're good under these conditions. But they're not good under all conditions. Most people would look through these glasses and say, oh, how can you see like that? And so they're, they're good for a very specific sort of condition of eyes being in this particular condition. Most of the goods are like that. You might think a college education is a good thing, and it is a good thing, again, under a wide range of conditions, but not under all possible conditions. There might be conditions under which it's useless or even harmful. And so most of the goods we care about in the world, even money, is highly useful, don't get me wrong, but on the other hand, it's good if you have a certain kind of monetary system, if there's something you can actually buy with it and so on. If you're in a condition where you've got lots of money, but there's nothing to buy, it doesn't really do you any good. So all of those things are qualified goods. What would be an unqualified good? Something that's good no matter what. Kant says there's one and only one thing like that, a goodwill. That's the only thing that we can say is really necessarily good. 
good in this world and even out of it. Good in such a way that you can't even conceive of a situation where it wouldn't be good. Well, I think there are two questions you can ask here. One is, is a good will really good without qualification? Is it good no matter what? Now, we don't want to just say, by the way, oh, it's a verbal thing. A good will is good. That's just like saying a good shirt is good. <laughs> it's true by definition. Then it would be just a verbal or analytic truth, and it isn't actually telling us anything about ethics. So Kant doesn't mean this in a sense that just makes it automatically true by the meanings of words. He really wants to make a substantive claim here that what he is going to describe as a good will is good no matter what. But the second point is that, well, are there other candidates? What he does is now go through a list of the things he takes to be the most plausible other candidates and argue that they are actually not good without qualification. Is it a comprehensive list? Well, I don't know. And so you can worry he hasn't gone through all the possible competitors. He's gotten through some of the main ones. But you can also worry that he has really never given us a defense of the claim that a good will is good no matter what. Let's turn first to those other candidates in that second question. Is anything else good without qualification? Well, if you think of this in Aristotelian terms, you're going to think, what about the virtues? Surely the virtues are things that are good without qualification. After all, Aristotle talks about the intellectual virtues, the moral virtues. Those seem essential to thriving, to being a good person. Maybe they're good without qualification. But Kant denies it. He says, intelligence, wit, judgment, and the other talents of the mind, however they may be named, in other words, what Aristotle would have called the intellectual virtues, but then also courage, resolution, perseverance as qualities of temperament. So here, the moral virtues, in Aristotle's terms, are undoubtedly good and desirable in many respects, but these gifts of nature may also become extremely bad and mischievous if the will which is to make use of them and which therefore constitutes what is called character is not good. Well, he's got a substantive and interesting argument here. Intelligence, is it always a good thing? Good under a wide range of conditions, don't get me wrong, but is it always good? Not necessarily. What if it is combined with a bad will? Is an evil genius better or worse than an evil fool? Kant says, look, the fact that that evil being is highly intelligent, the fact that they have excellent judgment, all of those things are not good. Here's one way to imagine. Imagine that you have an arch enemy, a nemesis. This person takes it as their purpose to destroy you. Do you want them to be highly intelligent? Do you want them to be witty so people like them? Do you want them to have great judgment about how to destroy you? No. I mean, to the extent that they're intelligent or witty or have excellent judgment or wise, you think, that's a bad thing. I don't want them to have that character. And it's not just that it's bad for me. You might say, look, their designs are evil. I don't deserve any of this. It's bad if they're intelligent. It's bad if they're witty. It's bad if they have good judgment. What about those moral characters? Is it good if they're courageous? No. I don't want them to be courageous. If somebody's going to hate me and try to destroy me, I'd prefer that they'd be a coward. It would be better if they were a coward. Well, what about persistence? Shouldn't they be persistent and go after you no matter what? No, I want them to give up easily. I don't want them to be persistent. What about the other things, the other moral characters? I mean, resolute. You want them to be resolute, don't you? Really deeply committed to destroying you. No, no, I want them not at all to be resolute. Um, and then go through the other moral things. Do you want them to be generous? Well, maybe if that means they don't want to destroy me, I do, but otherwise, no, <laughs> not really. That's another way of them earning goodwill from other people. I don't want that. You want them to be friendly? Well, toward me, but if their goal remains to destroy me, then no, I don't want them to have a bunch of friends who are going to help them do it. And so on. So I could go through that whole list and say, look, these are not good if they're combined with someone who does not have a good will. I do not want somebody who is evil to actually have all these moral virtues and intellectual virtues. They are not good if they're not accompanied by a good will. What about happiness or other kinds of things that are components to happiness? Aristotle talks about internal components like virtues, 
But also, he says, to live well, look, it requires external things. It requires a certain amount of luck, gifts of fortune. Well, Kant says, think first about those gifts of fortune. Are they always good? Kant says, no. It's the same with gifts of fortune. Power, riches, honor, even health, and the general well-being and contentment with one's condition, which is called happiness, inspire pride and often presumption if there isn't a good will to correct the influence of these on the mind, and with this also to rectify the whole principle of acting and adapt, to it, and adapt it to its end. Here's what he has in mind. Is it always good to have power? Is it always good to be rich? Always good to have lots of honor? Is it always good to be healthy? Well, one way to look at it is to turn that toward the kind of archenemy I was talking about. But another is to say, what do they do to people? Kant's first concern is to say, look, even if we think about just what's good for you, not with somebody you might be trying to oppose or in conflict with, is it good for you to have power? Is it good for you to gain riches? Well, I wouldn't mind the experiment. <laughs> but actually, you know, he's saying no. And here, for examples, you can think about all sorts of people who are corrupted by power or corrupted by wealth, corrupted by all the honor they receive from the outside. What do I have in mind? Well, actually, as an example, you could take almost any childhood star from the Disney Channel. Look at the number of people who have been these childhood stars who gain fame, wealth, power, really, of a kind. Um, cultural power, but as well as power by having a TV show that has high ratings and so on, as young children. What happens to them? Often their lives fall apart. It corrupts them. As he says, it inspires pride and leads them to, to make terrible judgments about things. It corrupts their character. The same thing often happens to other people who achieve stardom early. It's all downhill from there, and often it, it shatters them. It makes them filled with pride, but also gives them these expectations for everyone else they end up feeling they cannot fulfill. It's a destructive combination. So there are all sorts of people who attain wealth, fame, power early and find themselves destroyed by it. The same thing can happen to a political leader who rises to power quickly, who starts out being a leader that many people admire, and then ends up being corrupted by it. Benito Mussolini might be a good example of this sort of thing. In the early 20s, when he took power, by force, by the way, not by being elected, but a lot of people admired Mussolini. In fact, there's a song um, that, in an early version, had a verse that said, you know, you're the top, you're the Mussolini. Well, that's kind of amazing, given what happened later with Mussolini. But this sort of thing happened as well to all sorts of Roman emperors. It's happened to many leaders throughout history. They seem to be good people, they gain power, often quite quickly, and it's corrupting. It destroys them. So Kant is saying, look, these things are not always good. In fact, Warren Buffett, the very wealthy investor, has said he, he's not leaving his fortune to his children. He makes them, throughout their growing up time, he did not give them much of an allowance and so on. Because he's terribly stingy? No, because he thought it would corrupt them. Because he thought that much wealth, that much power, early would not be a good thing. But that's not the only consideration. Kant says the sight of a being who is not adorned with a single feature of a pure and good will, enjoying unbroken prosperity, can never give pleasure to an impartial, rational spectator. Thus a good will appears to constitute the indispensable condition, even of being worthy of happiness. What matters here isn't being happy, it's being worthy of being happy. So even if we turn to happiness itself, we say, if my arch enemy is happy, if somebody I think is deeply evil is happy, that doesn't give me pleasure. <laughs> that doesn't give pleasure to an impartial, rational spectator. That's something that makes you think there's something deeply wrong. What if, as an impartial, rational spectator, you're there at the movie theater and you see a movie about someone who is deeply evil, really, doesn't have one speck of a good and pure will and ends up happy. It ends with that person happy. They get the girl. They get the fortune. They get what they want. They ride off into the sunset. And they've done horrible things. And you know they're planning to do more horrible things. And it all works out great for them. Do you say, 
wow, that's great. No, you don't. <laughs> you say, I, uh, th that was really bad. I mean, gosh, that, that person was really deeply evil, and I couldn't find anything good in them, nothing good at all. And then it worked out so that they're happy and everything's good for them. I don't think that's a good thing at all, right? And so Kant is saying, look, an impartial, rational spectator. By the way, he is the first, I think, of a series of philosophers to say that should be a key concept of ethics. Think about what would be approved by an impartial, rational spectator. That's what's good. And he's saying such a person would never view happiness as a good thing if the person who's happy is not at all a good person. So, is a good will the only thing? Well, those candidates at least are not good candidates for being good without qualification. It's not the intellectual virtues, not the moral virtues, not the gifts of fortune, not happiness itself. All of those things might be intrinsically good, as Aristotle says. They're good for their own sake, but are they always good? No, Kant says they are not always good. Not good no matter what. Are there any other candidates that he doesn't survey? Well, maybe. When I've talked to people, when I've asked classrooms of students about this, they've proposed things like, well, what about love and friendship? Is that always a good thing? Actually, I'm sure some people have experiences with friendships that went badly, love relationships that went badly. Maybe friendship and love aren't always good. What about self-respect? Surely self-respect is good no matter what. There, I think we're much closer. And actually, Kant, I think, would be somewhat sympathetic with that answer. But I think in the end, he's going to say, look, that's very closely related to what I mean by a good will, so relax. Um, that's going to get covered to the extent that it ought to be covered by this principle. And then what about communion with God? A lot of religious thinkers would say, here's what's good without qualification. It's nothing in this world, including a good will. It's really communion with God. And that relationship of enjoying God forever, that is the thing that is good no matter what. I don't think Kant thinks about that, at least in, the, in his ethical works. He does at some points talk about religion. And I think he thinks at this point we've gone beyond the bounds of what philosophy really can do. Religion, as we'll see elsewhere if we have time to think about this, is something that Kant thinks, well, we can draw certain inferences about. But we have to be careful. We don't really have theoretical knowledge of this. So our ethical theory is not going to be able to evaluate that option and tell us either that that is an example of an unqualified good or that it's not. Instead, we're going to have to trust something else to give us information about that. So at least within the bounds of reason, he's going to say, a good will is the only plausible candidate. Things that go beyond that, well, maybe. We can't rule it out but we can't rule it in either within the bounds of an ethical theory. Maybe in some other way we can. There's something else I think we should worry about, though. Go back to that first question. Is it really true that a good will is good without qualification? Is it good no matter what? Maybe nothing is good without qualification. Maybe all goods are qualified goods. That looks, at least looks like a possibility. So how can we be sure? That that's not true. Aristotle has a kind of infinite regress argument that all goods can't be instrumental goods. In the end, they must be for the sake of something ultimate. These chains of this for the sake of that for the sake of that must end somewhere. But here, it's not like qualified goods are done for the sake of or in some other relation to an unqualified good. Kant has no such argument. So why should we, we think there is anything at all that's good without qualification? And in fact, we have Phrases like this little proverb, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So you might think, yeah, look, the good will, good intentions, if that's what you mean by that, that's not always good. Sometimes the best intentions lead you to do things that are not at all a good thing to do. So that seems, at first glance, like an option. Well, that's not exactly what Kant means by a good will. It's not simply a question of good intentions. But that raises the question for us, what is a good will? What does he mean by a good will? It turns out the answer is this. A good will is one that acts on the basis of universal considerations. It acts on the basis of principle. 
It is not influenced, Kant says, by subjective particular determinations. The proper and inestimable worth of an absolutely good will consists just in this, that the principle of action is free from all influence of contingent grounds. Now that's a rather surprising and rather theoretical answer. So what does he mean? Well, let's look at the inverse of that. What would it mean to be influenced by subjective and particular determinations? It means to decide things on the basis of what I happen to like, things that are purely subjective, my tastes and preferences, on particular determinations, that is to say on things about particular people, particular circumstances, particular events. So suppose, for example, that I assigned grades to students on the basis of subjective factors. I just thought, thought yeah, yeah, I like that student, A. I don't really like that one, C minus. So suppose I did that. You say, that's really bad. That is not approaching this task with a good will. You're just letting your own subjective responses. You're not actually evaluating this. You're not evaluating the work. You're just going on the basis of your own subjective reactions. Well, true, I would be. That would be a really bad thing to do. And it would show that I didn't have a good will in giving out those grades. Or suppose as a judge, someone said, hmm, you know, I, I like the prosecuting attorney. I don't like the defense attorney. So, guilty. <laughs> That's no way to decide a case. Evidence? Ever heard of evidence? Reasoning? Law, judge? So you'd say, that, yeah, that judge does not have a good will. You can't go on the basis of whether you like the attorney or don't like the attorney. Similarly, particular determinations. It shouldn't matter who that particular defendant is. You can't say, well, hmm, anybody else accused of this crime with that evidence, I would think is guilty. But that guy, I've heard of him. I'm not going to say he's guilty just because he's that guy. <laughs> okay? Well, uh, I mean, look, that happens, right? When people who are famous or powerful or otherwise known to a judge, or at least whose names are known, they get treated differently. And we tend to think that's a bad thing. That's wrong. The lie should apply. <laughs> the lie. The law should apply to everyone. Uh, it shouldn't be a matter of this person getting this treatment, that person getting that treatment, even though they're so situations are exactly similar, and even though the laws that apply are the same. And so a judge that decided that way, on the basis of subjective reactions, on the basis of particular determinations, because it's that defendant, we want to say, no, that's wrong. That is not approaching this with a good will. Well, what is a good will then? Somebody who doesn't do that. Somebody who says, well, look, this is a legal question. So I'm looking at the law, I'm looking at the evidence, I'm looking at the facts of the case. That's what I look at. That's what I decide on the basis of. Or the professor who looks at the grading and says, well, how good were your exams? How good was that paper? And does it on the basis of those criteria, not on the basis of subjective considerations, not on the basis of, oh, but it was you, <laughs> but instead tries to do this abstracting away from it all. Some people in grading, in fact, in law schools, it's routine that in grading, it's all done by, in effect, a number in such a way that the professor doesn't know whose paper or whose exam is being graded. It is purely a, okay, student number 17, I have no idea who that is. To keep it all objective, to keep it away from anything that might be subjective or particular as a determination, to guarantee that the professor is objective and exhibiting a good will. So one way of looking at this is Kant is saying, here is what it is to approach a decision with a good will. It is to do it on objective grounds, to do it on grounds that you would apply across the board in similar situations that are not shaped by your own subjective tastes and preferences and likes and dislikes and anything about this particular person or this particular place or anything of that kind. So here's another way of putting it that's more general than that, perhaps. A person has goodwill and their act has moral worth when they act from duty out of respect for the moral law. Doing the right thing for the right reason, in other words, because it's right, or maybe we should say a little more precisely, for the reason that makes it right. That is always good. So it's always good to do the right thing for the reason and to do it because it is the right thing to do. That's what is your duty. A good will, a person of good will, is somebody who does the right thing 
for the right reason precisely because it is right. Well, that now, Kant is saying, is always good without qualification. Of course, you might say again, isn't this just a verbal? Doing the right thing for the right reason? Yeah, I mean, you kind of built the right right in there, Kant. But don't put the stress there. It's the focus on duty, saying, I am acting on the basis of what is right. I'm doing it because it's right. That's the key to a good will. Not, I'm doing it because I want to. I'm doing it because I like this sort of thing. I'm doing it because I feel like it. I'm doing it because blah, blah, blah. Do it because it's right. That's what it is to have a good will. Anything else betrays a good will. So Kant says that, that is the thing that's always good. Doing it because it's the right thing to do.